Okay, good afternoon. Apologies to the mind today. Appreciate there's a lot going on at the moment. Um, I want to run through a number of earthquake-related matters today. But uh, before I start, let me say I'm attending the Canterbury uh, Cabinet Committee uh, Earthquake Committee meeting at 5 o'clock tonight. So I can obviously be late, but my preference is to be there um, as on time as I can be. So I won't take a, a million questions this afternoon. Firstly, I want to announce that a national memorial service to mark uh, February the 22nd earthquake and its impact will be held on Friday the 18th of March in Christchurch. The date has been chosen in conjunction uh, with the office of Mayor Bob Parker. The service will be held at North Hagley Park in Christchurch and, st and starts at 12.45pm. The service will allow people the chance to reflect on the terrible loss of life suffered as a result of the earthquake and the huge impact it has had on our second largest city. Uh, there will be a provincial holiday called for the 18th of March in Canterbury so that people of the province can attend the memorial service if they wish to do so. Legislation will be required uh, for the provision of a, of a provincial holiday uh, in Canterbury. Flags, I've also decided that the flags on government buildings should be raised from half-mast at 12.51pm tomorrow, exactly two weeks after the earthquake occurred. I now want to run, uh, turn briefly to the government's response and indicate um, some next issues in terms of the earthquake. Rebuilding will be a long and complex task and one which will have to be worked through step by step. In the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, our priority was the rescue operation. We also put in place measures to help people who have had their livelihoods impacted, namely through the six-week uh, wage subsidy and job loss package. So far, just under 5,500 employers have applied for the earthquake support subsidy, which takes into account over 28,600 staff. This is positive because it means that uh, these employers are keeping the employment relationship with their staff as they seek to get back up and running again. Just over 6,000 sole traders and contractors have also joined the scheme, and just over 3,000 people have taken up the job loss cover. We now have eight recovery assistance centres open, mostly spread across the heart of the east of the city. These centres are one-stop shops for people so they can work with a number of service providers, get counselling or just have a cup of tea. We have also provided more than $8 million in civil defence emergency grants and there will be more support coming over the next uh, few weeks and months. Getting people's homes restored as quickly as possible is a critical priority for us. 96% of households outside the CBD now have power and that's expected to rise to 99% tonight. About 80% have running water and over half have flushing toilets. Uh, due to severe damage in the eastern suburbs, some households may well be without these vital services for some time yet. But I want to assure people that everything that can be done is being done in terms of restoring essential infrastructure. Early indications are that 10,000 houses will need to be demolished and over 100,000 more could be damaged. EQC has begun land assessments and will begin assessing houses from this week. Fletcher's has already started emergency repairs to make houses habitable. Staff from Housing New Zealand and the Department of Building and Housing are also collating offers of emergency accommodation and working to provide both short and longer term accommodation. Just a note on Portaloos, I asked for and received a report from Civil Defence on the situation with regard to Portaloos and chemical toilets, particularly in Christchurch's badly hit eastern suburbs. What is clear is that we don't have enough of these chemical toilets and Portaloos. That situation is being rectified as quickly as possible by bringing more in from overseas. However, there is no evidence from the report that I've received that, that they've been allocated on anything other than um, the basis of need, and that need is being assessed um, all the time. Um, it's my indications that we'll, we'll release that report to you to read uh, in due course. Uh, just a word on institutional arrangements going forward. It is clear that we'll need different arrangements compared to what was set up after the September earthquake. We are looking at something significantly more centralised than last time, uh, but that does not mean Christchurch will be shut out, in fact far from it. Whatever structure is adopted will include ways for the community to have input, while at the same time having stronger, more direct central government involvement. 
We're still working on how these structures might look. Decisions on this will be made in coming weeks. Just in terms of the House this week, tomorrow I'll make a statement to Parliament regarding the earthquake, followed by a statement from the Minister of Civil Defence. The House will then debate the second reading of the Marine and Coastal Area Bill and the committee stages of the Legal Services Bill. On Wednesday, the House will debate the Budget Policy Statement before moving on to uh, Members' Bills. On Thursday, we'll start the committee stage of the Marine and Coastal Area Bill. Just in terms of my own activity, tomorrow we have caucus and question time. On Wednesday, I'm in Wellington. On Thursday, I plan to visit Christchurch, and on Friday, I'm back in Auckland. What will actually happen um, that has in Yeah, so obviously a very significant event that uh, reflects uh, the, the nature of the tragedy that's taken place in Christchurch. Uh, I'd expect uh, people from overseas to be attending that, um, signifying the international citizens that have lost their lives. Um, by having a provincial holiday in Can Canterbury, we think we're in a position to allow anyone in the Canterbury region to come and attend that service. My guess is that you'll see tens of thousands, if not 100,000 plus people attending the service. Certainly when uh, we had a similar tragedy uh, in Pike River uh, on the west coast, you saw the entire community turn out there. Are you Uh, well, look, we hope to be. I mean, that, the indications are that we're likely to be. I mean, good progress is being made. Um, whether we'll have the name of everyone that's uh, been a fatality as a result of the earthquake, I'm not sure. Uh, but we certainly hope to be. Prime Minister, do you agree with uh, Gary Brownlee that only a handful of heritage buildings could remain in Crossfield? Well, I think the point he's been making is that. Uh, there is significant damage to a lot of buildings in the CBD area and many of those will need to be knocked down. Some of those clearly include heritage buildings. I don't think he's arguing that there's no case for uh, the, the very iconic buildings. They will, in my view, be rebuilt, the cathedral and, and basilica and, and others like Rickerton House. Uh, but I do think we have to brace ourselves for the fact that a great many buildings will be knocked down as a result of the earthquake. Did he go too far though? Was he a bit blunt? No, I wouldn't say that. I think he's just simply, um, I think, reflecting what the feeling is on the ground, which is that there's been a lot of damage, um, that those buildings have claimed uh, the lives of, of uh, innocent people, and that we need to make sure that the buildings are now structurally sound for an area that we just have to acknowledge is more prone to earthquakes. Jim Brownie said that only a handful should remain. Do you agree with him that you know, only, the, only those ones you should mention, they should be the only ones left? Well, I can't comment on that because I simply haven't seen the advice on all of the buildings here. Um, great many heritage buildings in Christchurch. Some may not have been affected at all by the quake. Others have been slightly affected. Others will be demolished. Until I can see that, I can't comment. All I can tell you is there's a formalised process for how a, the decision is made about whether a building is demolished. And in the case of a heritage building, it's a more rigorous process before that demolition order is executed. So it's true, works. isn't it, that more people were killed in buildings that were built in the 60s and 70s? Well, that's right. Well, I mean, by definition, actually, I mean, the CTV building will be the building that's claimed the, the majority of lives, and that was obviously built, I think, in the, in the early 70s, um, PGC you know, in, in the early 60s. But, Clearly some of those old buildings and the likes, I think, of Manchester Street and others, you know, the, the facades falling off looks like they've claimed the lives of people there as well, very sadly. Can you explain a bit more about the provincial holiday? Does that mean Canterbury employers have to give their workers a paid day off? That's right. So effectively it will act like um, we would expect a normal sort of, you know, Auckland anniversary day or a, it's, it's a public holiday for the people of Christchurch and the normal holiday provisions um, apply. We need to pass legislation to do that because we don't. Uh, the Act doesn't allow just allow us just to declare a provincial holiday. Uh, we obviously considered the issue about whether we'd have a nationwide uh, public holiday, but in the in the view of of cabinet was that probably a provincial holiday reflects better the the way that we would like to approach the situation. Is it a one-off? It's a one-off. Yeah. Isn't it a bit unfair on employers who are already stressed? Yeah, so look, there's no getting away from the fact that there is some cost, but this is a trade-off between what we think is practical and the way that we think the, the region will want to mourn what is the most significant event in Christchurch. And I think if you put that in context, I mean, if you go to, again, the, the service that was undertaken at Pike River or in, in Greymouth, um, the entire community turned out uh, to pay respect to those uh, 29 men that lost their lives. I think you'll find when this... Uh, day of mourning is held in Christchurch, 
Uh, I think an overwhelming number of Cantabrians will want to show solidarity and support for that day. Now, if we don't have a public holiday on that day for those people, you get into a position where it becomes much more difficult for people to attend. Uh, you have all the issues around schools, all the issues around lower income uh, New Zealanders who actually may not necessarily be allowed to have a day off more easily because they work at the checkout of the supermarket or whatever it might be. So my view is that um, to mark what is a very, very significant event, um, it's appropriate to have a public holiday uh, from people in Canberra. Um, around the country? Well, I think there are a number of things. Firstly, it's starting at 12.45, um, partly to coincide with the time that the earthquake took place at 12.51. Secondly, I think it's a good time that others will be able to watch um, the, the televised service. I'm sure they'll be significantly televised. Um, others may want to choose to do something in their workplace, for instance. I, mean, I think employers might want to think creatively about how they um, mark that particular day. Um, I also think it's, personally, I think it's a day to, to mourn uh, the, the loss of life. It's also a day to reflect on the significant damage that's been caused to Christchurch. But it's also a day to reflect on the preciousness of life and the fact that there are uh, many remarkable stories of Cantabrians that didn't lose their life that day through a, a great act of, of late, luck or fate or whatever took place. And I think you will see some employers that on that day uh, choose to, as a, as a workplace, to watch the service and then maybe afterwards have have some sort of function, a barbecue or something that might just celebrate that life is a very precious thing. But we're on the public holiday, sorry, you may mention the people on the checkouts, and often obviously on most, a lot of public holidays, supermarkets, etc., are still open, so yeah. what the legislation make it clear that those sorts of workplaces will have to be closed? No, I mean, it'll be it'll be treated as, um, and we're not deliberately not going to do that, I mean, there will be services that, that open, um, just like any other sort of provincial holiday. So it's not like, uh, I think it's Anzac Day, isn't it, where you can't shop in the morning and the likes. It won't be like that. But obviously, um, I think we would ask in the spirit of goodwill that as many people are able to attend, can attend. Canterbury Tourism would like some money to start uh, trying to undo and some of the damage yep. tourism and sort of funds here. Is the government considering something like that? Yeah, so we haven't started considering that now, um, but I'll have a chat to the Minister of Tourism and I'm sure we can find a way to doing something in that regard. So basically the long short of it is there's no point in advertising, I think, and promoting Christchurch today um, in a dedicated campaign because we've got substantial work that needs to be done uh, to get Christchurch back up on its feet. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of things which are planned for the future and there will need to be a very clear international message sent that Christchurch is open for business. And I think when we're at a point to send that more positive message, then we'll look to... It's not... Well, it's open to business in a form at the moment. Parts of the city are actually operating well. But in the wider message of please come back and visit um, Christchurch and Canterbury, we want to get that message out there clearly. Uh, but I think it's when you choose your time to start advertising. If we start today, I think that'll be full on deaf ears. But I think... Will we, in three or six months' time, have a dedicated campaign to promote Christchurch? I think the answer is through the RTO, possibly, yes. And did you get a briefing from the Rugby World Cup Minister about uh, the possibility of the Rugby World Cup in Christchurch? We did. Um, so what I'd say is, again, the Cabinet understands the significance, if possible, of wanting to have uh, the uh, World Cup hosted in Christchurch. Now, in the end, the final decision I might add for that uh, is made by the IRB. Um, we've clarified that point. Having said that, we're working very closely with them uh, on all of those issues. We we will have, we think, a clearer picture on the from a from an engineering perspective on uh, whether AMI Stadium can be um, or any issues, any structural issues, um, remediated and be in a position where we could get public liability insurance and the likes within a few weeks. So that's the box that has to be ticked. From there then the issue becomes more interesting. There's damage to the turf as well, but we think we can get on top of that. What's that? No, no, I don't think it's looking bleak. I think we just don't, won't have a clear answer for a couple of weeks, but we're getting closer. Have you seen the stadium yourself since the Not on the ground, but in the year, yes. The stadium's one thing, though, but the infrastructure, the public transport, the hotels, etc. you must have some idea how... Uh, yeah, I think the biggest issue is ultimately the stadium. I mean, we know that there's some damage to the Dean stand and there's some damage to the Hadley stand and there's some liquefaction outside and the turf has significant liquefaction damage, which means it needs to be re rebuilt. And that's that takes a num quite a number of months. Um, in the end, if we can get a stadium that operates and everyone is comfortable with, then yes, we need to deal with accommodation issues and we need to deal with you know bars and restaurants and the likes. But um, I think... 
I think we can address those issues, um, but we can't do that unless we have a stadium that gets the tick off. What level of overseas representation at the memorial service are you expecting? Um, at this stage we don't know uh, precisely, but I imagine there'll be, uh, I think there'll be some high level representation that's about to be stuck in liberty at the moment. You're not expecting heads of government or? Um, not a great many, I'm sure they'll probably be represented by uh, their high commissioners or ambassadors, but you know, let's see, it's a very significant event, we may see something. Did you consider delaying the um, foreshore and sea dead second reading you know, while the country's still in mourning? No. More than 20 Chinese students killed in the city of building, and their family members have waited for more than 10 days, and they still they have they haven't been identification of the bodies. Yeah. So some will get frustrated, and also some of the family members are concerned about the city of building quality. So what's your comment on that? Yes, so firstly let me acknowledge the deep frustration for uh, those Chinese families and in fact the families of all of the international students. Um, secondly, I think we all need to acknowledge the significance of the collapse of the CTV building and uh, the, the difficulty that poses in terms of victim identification for uh, the coronary staff who are doing the best that they possibly can. Um, we are working through that process uh, as quickly as we can. Um, I've received a report on that from, from the Justice Department about the coronial services and the amount of personnel they have working on that, and I think they're making very good progress. They're likely to add an additional team from Korea uh, to bolster their numbers, but they're making very good progress. In terms of the general inquiry about the structure of the CTV building, uh, again, we think we'll be in a position by next week to outline for you the nature of the inquiry or inquiries that will flow from the Canterbury earthquake. But clearly, the CTV building as the place where so many people lost their lives uh, will, is a particular area of interest and focus to us. Does the Korean DVI team replacing a group or are they no. additional? Additional. Presumably is an acknowledgement that there hasn't been no, I think, look, there have they've, they've been a lot of people. I mean, we uh, that's the question I've been asking. You know, do you have enough staff? Can we help you? Can we add any more? There have been teams from around the world, but this is an additional service. We decided to add that as well. I mean, I think on by any measure they're making good progress, but um, it, there are a number of, of unfortunately, of, of, of victims who are very badly um, damaged as a result of the earthquake, both the crushing and the fire, particularly at CTV. And the, the um, I think it's the anti-mortem uh, requirements in terms of, of uh, collecting that DNA evidence and matching that with the victims is made more difficult with international students or international citizens. Just on the, um, the committee or the earthquake commission yeah. that's going to oversee Christchurch, can you give any indication of who might be on it? Yeah, it's just sort of too early days yet to do that, but we are making progress. I mean, what we are really saying is, look, the, 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 the size and scale of the, the job required to rebuild Christchurch is vastly larger than the first earthquake presented. And on that basis, uh, the equivalent of the Earthquake Recovery Commission wouldn't be acceptable to the government or the right thing actually for Christchurch. Because at one level, you know, I absolutely agree with the, the Minister where he says, look, we need to cut through the bureaucracy there. We also need to work closely, clearly, with the people of Christchurch and other interested parties, but we just need to have a structure which is more efficient. And it also needs to reflect the enormous infrastructural rebuild that will be required, most of which will be funded by the government. So we're looking at a number of potential structures to allow that happen. And what it power, to happen. What power will that have in terms of over the, the current uh, or the city council? Uh, well, all of those things are being worked through at the moment, but obviously we want to work very closely with the council. But they are the sort of discussions that we're having. What hard progress have you, uh, have you made on emergency housing, given that 10,000 homes are going to be demolished? Yeah. And, and Winter's, you know, just around the corner, sure. and apparently it's very cold in Christchurch today, it's raining. Yeah. Um, these people have got no heating, and probably shouldn't even be in these houses. So what's, yeah. what's around the corner? Yeah, so the first thing I probably note is that there is more temporary accommodation available at the moment than people actually taking that temporary accommodation up. And you will have seen last week that the housing minister um, actually indicated that, that his ministry has been working on securing camper vans and the likes to provide alternatives. Um, so there are, there are other options for people. Uh, many people don't necessarily want to move out of their home despite the fact that there are no basic infrastructure services there. A number of people I met on the ground 
on Friday in Christchurch made that clear to me that you don't want to move out. Um, that said, there's a number of things we'll need to move to work through. One is ultimately identifying whether a home can be rebuilt. There will be some homes that cannot be rebuilt. And as a result of the second earthquake, uh, potentially some sections and some areas of Christchurch which will need to be abandoned and we will have to present other alternatives for people to live in because the land has been so badly damaged we can't fix it. Certainly not in a, a reasonable time frame. What about um, obviously the September 4th earthquake, Sorry. we're moving into summer, but with this earthquake now moving into yes. autumn and then winter, I mean, do you have any reports around you know, what problems that will create? I haven't had any reports on that, but I think it look at <coughs> staying the obvious that you know, winter's cold in Christchurch, people are in environments which have been very badly damaged by the earthquake. Um, you know, the rain and the cold presents a new set of issues for us and we need to move quickly uh, to provide alternatives for people. Land that is, you know, deemed unbuildable or, you know, ruined. Yeah. So I think there will be certain um, areas of Christchurch, and I don't know how large them. I mean, they might be limited to streets, but they might be larger than that. Where the option simply is, um, a here is a cash option, you can take the cheque. Or the second option is here is a subdivision, and you uh, can can choose a site and maybe a building plan that's commensurate with the, the insurance model you had but there will be some parts of Christchurch that can't be rebuilt on. Um, the liquefaction damage from the second earthquake is so great and the land damage, the early indications are that it's um, so significant we can't remediate it in, a, in any time frame. Now that is a sort of good news, bad news story. It, for some people it will be very frustrating because they'll be moving away from where they're living currently but we can do that much faster because under the old model we were looking at remediating <coughs> land. In some instances we were essentially asking people to move out of their house for a couple of years while uh, the remediation took place and the house was demolished and the house was rebuilt. Now they might just be going to another section. How many people that affects, we don't know. That's the geotechnical advice we're getting at the moment. And can you basically just tell people the house has been demolished and they have to go? Well the issue will be it will be uninsurable on the land that they're currently on. That's the first issue that we see presenting itself. But look, in certain parts of Christchurch, particularly in the east, where the liquefaction dam has been so great, the land has sunk. So where we looked at, from Tonkin and Taylor, the earlier advice about remediation to land, there was literally a scale of sort of one to five, one being virtually compacted, don't do anything, five being the absolute gold standard. We were probably working in the order of about a three. That is not feasible now in some of these streets. Happens, so it's very expensive. What happens in terms of then getting in? Is it just insurance, they just get the insurance and then just walk away and... Well, we'll need to work through it, but yeah, by, by definition, I think we'll be in a position where the combination of EQC and their private insurance hopefully will be enough to make sure we can put them in a, in a new home. Have you talked to... Have you talked to the CBD effect like that? Because Don't know. Certainly there's a lot of buildings that are going to come down. The question that will be literally plot by plot what is required to you know, ensure that the land is stable enough and sound enough to rebuild a building. And we just don't know that yet, but every section is going to have to be tested in that regard. Does it mean that there's any indications of what numbers there are? You talked about some subject. Don't know the answer to that question yet. The 10,000 homes you say need to be demolished, are yeah. they effectively on land which you think can't be remediated? Definitely not all 10,000, <clears> but what number I don't know. Have, have you talked <coughs> to your officials or ministers about this option of buying land? Yeah, absolutely. Are you talking, are you talking um, about more than the 100,000 for land at the EQC limit, you know, like the government yeah. adding more to the cheque? Well, I don't know, but we might be in a position, if we can secure some land through uh, some of the subdivisions that are there, to put together a package because of the, the quantum of it, which is attractive. That's what we're working through. And there are a number of options in terms of subdivisions in Christchurch. Can you give us any idea of some of the, the major issues on your agenda of the Cabinet Committee? Um, yeah, look, there's a number of things we're looking at. The inquiry is, uh, and what form the inquiry takes and how that works is obviously one part of it. Um, this whole issue around um, accommodation um, is another issue we're just sort of trying to work through quickly. Um, there are other issues around uh, the structure, ultimately, of what, uh, you know, how we support the minister and how the, the interaction between central and local government works. And quite frankly, across the board, there's just an array of issues that we're dealing with at the moment. You'll appreciate the quite broad nature. Is this housing accommodation issue actually looming? Is, is kind of a new, like a looming crisis that just 
become a health crisis, become a crime crisis. I mean, it sounds like it's too big to handle in a hurry. No, I don't think it's too big to handle. I mean, as I say, ironically, the this current position is that we've got more accommodation available than's currently been taken up. Now, that position may change as some people return to Christchurch or as people's frustration of, of living in an environment, even if we can get the electricity, for instance, back on, um, grows. Uh, but that's, that's something we're working our way through. And there's a whole, that, sorry, the other element I should add in that, of course, is modular housing is potentially an, another thing we're doing to accommodate people. Is it 10,000 homes is our expectation will be demolished. And it was 3,300 after the first earthquake. When can we get that report? You said you're going to release some the eastern suburbs. The suburbs. Um, I'll ask my office, but I can't see a particular reason why I can't have it straight away. I'll, I'll ask our guys. So some of the stuff um, you're looking at modular homes from, say, um, from Australia, um, does it like 10 housing? And, and New Zealand, there's some capability around New Zealand. Uh, well, some of the indications we had today is there's a number of, of, of um, suppliers around the country that can, can deliver us homes again quite quickly. We're looking at options about where we could put those. Um, so, you know, there'll be, there'll be a range of different people. There'll be people whose home cannot be rebuilt on the site they're on who will simply want to pick another alternative, buy another house, build another house. Then there'll be people who need to move out temporarily um, but, but will return to their property and that just needs to be fixed and that could be anything from a short period of time to a longer period of time. Um, then there'll be others who can stay in their home while the repairs are taking place. Okay, thanks very much.